we're going deep into the scientific literature on what the most important stimulus for building muscle is. Along the way, the scientific research on many other fascinating topics will be intertwined in our search for what stimulates hypertrophy, such as the burn, pump, soreness, blood flow restriction training, eccentrics, acute spikes in anabolic hormones, the effects of antioxidants like vitamin C and E, high reps, low reps, failure training, and range of motion. Humans have been resistance training throughout history. From ancient India, we have accounts of a piece of exercise equipment noted in writings thought to be compiled between the 3rd century BC and 3rd century CE. Ancient Chinese artwork from a time period I don't know shows weightlifting activities. From ancient Egypt, we have these tomb paintings from around 2000 to 3500 BC, depicting individuals lifting weights. Moreover, ancient Egyptians knew in 1700 BC from poliomyelitis that not moving at all produced a decrease in muscle size. But it is only in the last 50 to 70 years that deeper insights into the stimuli behind muscle hypertrophy have been discovered thanks to the rise of scientific research. By the end of the video, I'm confident you'll have a thorough understanding of what the current scientific research says on the stimuli behind muscle hypertrophy. Before diving in, I want to mention that in the upcoming year, I'll be releasing free ultimate guide videos on developing each major muscle group right here on YouTube. My aim for them is to be comprehensive and in depth like no other. Before these videos, it's first extremely helpful for us to know what precisely stimulates hypertrophy as this will strongly relate to exercise selection recommendations. In the description and pinned comment, there will be in-depth timestamps to the parts and subparts of this video. Let's dive in. We'll go into serious depth on what mechanical tension precisely is later, but for now, think of it as the tension generated by a muscle's fibres. Does this fibre tension stimulate an increase in fibre size and subsequently whole muscle size? Intuitively it would, as if we substantially reduce the tension produced by muscle fibres, like done during immobilization or when in space, the whole muscle decreases in size. As early as the 1970s, researchers hypothesized both active and passive tension are stimulators of hypertrophy. Active tension is the actual contractile force produced by the muscle fibers, while passive tension is the force produced when the fibers and whole muscle are stretched. There were four types of studies linking active and passive tension to hypertrophy throughout the 1970s to 1990s. All of these studies were conducted on animals, and I want to preface this by saying I'm personally opposed to unnecessary animal studies, but as much as it's unfortunate to say, the following studies have all been pivotal in understanding muscle hypertrophy. The first type were studies that cut the tendon of usually the gastrocnemius, meaning this muscle could no longer carry out plantar flexion. This resulted in the supporting soleus muscle being overloaded and exposed to greater active tension during normal movement. In response to this, the studies consistently find the soleus experienced substantial hypertrophy, therefore linking increased active tension to hypertrophy. The second type of study had a limb immobilized while the muscle was placed in a stretched or shortened position. These experiments find muscle size decreases a lot less when the muscle is immobilized at a stretched versus shortened position, therefore indirectly linking passive tension to being anabolic. The third type of study involved attaching weights to a wing of chickens to produce continuous stretching of their muscles. Doing so results in hypertrophy of the stretched muscles. Finally, the fourth type of study was virtually the same as the third, except it used a spring-loaded aluminium bar to stretch the muscles of chickens. Doing so again results in hypertrophy of the muscle. But if we carefully think about these four types of studies, and this was discussed in future research, none of them truly prove tension per se is stimulating hypertrophy. Could it not be the events before active tension, like the electrical signals, metabolite accumulation, or even damage that is truly stimulating the hypertrophy in these studies? We'll thoroughly explore metabolite accumulation and damage soon. But the research in the last 20 years provides us with solid grounds to believe it is truly tension per se stimulating hypertrophy. A 2019 Danish study found that when inhibiting the active force generation from muscle fibers, but still allowing electrical signal input to them, activation of a key protein complex that signals muscle growth failed to occur. 
It was only when active force generation from muscle fibers was enabled did activation of the key protein complex happen. This suggests it is the active force from fibers that stimulates hypertrophy, not the electrical signals. The same researchers also established that when equating peak tension between eccentric contractions, which involved active and passive tension, and pure passive stretching, which would not involve active tension, only passive tension, activation of the key protein complex was the same. So this is evidence that it's total tension, regardless of whether it's active or passive, that stimulates hypertrophy. Another 2008 study out of the USA found that when keeping electrical input to a muscle constant, positioning the muscle at a length that allowed it to generate higher active forces resulted in greater activation of a key protein involved in signaling hypertrophy. So this study again demonstrates how it may indeed be tension per se that stimulates hypertrophy. A 2001 Canadian study found a linear relationship between peak tension and activation of a key protein involved in signaling hypertrophy. Finally, in the last 20 years or so, research is gradually accumulating on how precisely these forces can activate key proteins involved in hypertrophy. It turns out that within and around muscle fibers are mechanosensors that can detect active and or passive tension and then convert the tension into a signaling pathway that stimulates muscle hypertrophy. All of the key proteins explored in the previously mentioned studies are involved in the signaling pathways. We'll explore what these potential mechanosensors could be soon, but this overall evidence further strengthens the idea that tension per se is what stimulates hypertrophy. In humans, papers suggest that protocols that presumably involve higher mechanical tension results in greater muscle growth signaling and long-term muscle hypertrophy. Moreover, in human studies that presumably equate mechanical tension between different protocols, muscle growth signaling and long-term muscle hypertrophy tend to be the same. So it's clear solid research suggests mechanical tension is a powerful stimulator of muscle hypertrophy, but are there any other stimuli? I've previously had a shorter video on metabolic stress and hypertrophy. Although we'll mention things noted in that video, we will go into greater depth here with extra topics. Metabolic stress refers to the buildup of molecules produced by reactions related to energy production within muscle fibers. These molecules are called metabolites, and famous examples include lactate and reactive oxygen species. The accumulation of multiple metabolites is associated with pain and burning sensations during training. So it's certainly logical to feel these pain and burning sensations must surely be related to hypertrophy. Moreover, the accumulation of metabolites is closely tied to the pump, which is a temporary increase in muscle size. So it's certainly logical to think this plays a role in promoting long-term true hypertrophy. The oldest research I could find exploring the role of metabolites in hypertrophy comes from 1995. One of the papers found that concentric-only training produced similar quadriceps hypertrophy to eccentric-only training. Concentric only training is known to produce much higher metabolic stress than eccentric only training. So the authors hypothesized metabolic stress was heavily involved in producing the muscle growth seen by concentric only training, while perhaps mechanical tension or even damage caused the growth with eccentric only training. The second study by the same research team found holding continuous isometric contractions produced greater quadriceps hypertrophy than holding intermittent isometric contractions. The continuous isometric contractions produce measurably more metabolic stress, leading the researchers to hypothesize it was the metabolic stress causing the greater hypertrophy with continuous isometric contractions. However, both of these classic studies didn't truly isolate metabolic stress and prove it was stimulating hypertrophy. Concentric-only training still involves high mechanical tension, and the continuous isometric contractions, due to the training variables used in the study, would have likely generated more mechanical tension than the intermittent contractions. The authors did allude to this limitation in the paper. Moving forward to the early 2000s, emerging research demonstrated that blood flow restriction training with very light loads can be highly effective for producing muscle hypertrophy. Nowadays, despite some believing blood flow restriction training is useless, or others believing it is superior to normal training, the research consistently finds blood flow restriction training with light loads is as effective as heavier load training for building muscle. In case you're unaware, blood flow restriction training is where a cuff applies pressure to the upper part of a limb, completely restricting blood flow from the muscle to the heart, and partially restricting blood flow from the heart to the muscle. As a fun fact, blood flow restriction training originated in 1960s Japan by Yoshiaki Sato. 
Yoshiaki Sato was at a Buddhist memorial where during mass, his leg became numb due to sitting straight back while kneeling on the floor. He noticed his calves had pumped up, and he said it was a similar sensation to what he felt during intense calf raise exercises. This experience paved the way for Sato to experiment over the ensuing years and develop katsu training, which is what he called the blood flow restriction training. Back to our discussion. Performing high reps near failure with blood flow restriction will result in significant metabolic stress, and some speculate it's this metabolic stress causing the hypertrophy produced by blood flow restriction training. They believe mechanical tension must be low, since blood flow restriction training involves using very light loads. However, as detailed in this great 2017 USA review study, this is based on an incorrect view of mechanical tension. Getting near failure with light loads, including blood flow restriction training, will absolutely create high overall mechanical tension. The metabolic stress with blood flow restriction training might just be a byproduct of the effort required to get near failure to create this tension, not the cause of hypertrophy. Again, we'll go into depth on what mechanical tension is a little later. For the time being, just know it seems incredibly likely blood flow restriction training would produce muscle growth through mechanical tension. Having said this, there have been three studies finding blood flow restriction training produced preferential growth of slow twitch muscle fibers over fast twitch muscle fibers. Fast twitch muscle fibers have greater growth potential, and numerous studies indicate normal training results in more fast versus slow twitch fiber growth. And so some speculate the preferential slow twitch fiber growth by blood flow restriction training cannot be related to mechanical tension and might be due to some metabolic stress mechanism, but I'm very skeptical this is true. Two of the three studies involve blood flow restriction training with a very high training frequency. One involved blood flow restriction training for seven consecutive days, while the other involved training for five days in a week. The problem is central fatigue can be present days after training, especially when muscle damage is high. Despite previous speculations that blood flow restriction training produces minimal muscle damage, we now know there's research indicating performing reps to or near failure with blood flow restriction when you're unaccustomed to it, which applies to both two studies, produces substantial muscle damage. The issue of training while central fatigue is present is you have a lowered ability to recruit those fast twitch muscle fibers. Thus, the preferential growth of the slow twitch fibers in those two studies may not be because slow twitch fiber growth was enhanced via some metabolic stress related mechanism, rather it might be because fast twitch fiber growth was compromised due to training sessions being performed with central fatigue. What about that third study finding preferential slow twitch fiber growth with blood flow restriction training? It had untrained subjects train blood flow restriction with reps to failure three times per week for six weeks. Given the subjects were untrained, central fatigue may still have been present in a lot of their training sessions. So again, perhaps their findings reflect compromised fast twitch fiber growth. Furthermore, Another 2021 Australian paper found that in well-trained individuals training a range of lower body exercises with blood flow restriction three times per week for nine weeks, preferential slow twitch muscle fiber growth did not occur. So does all of this really mean metabolic stress plays no role in hypertrophy? In 2013, Brad Schoenfeld from New York published a comprehensive review of the potential paths by which metabolic stress could promote muscle growth. Five paths were noted. The first is metabolic stress and fatigue directly necessitates more muscle fibers getting recruited and therefore exposed to tension. The second is training that produces high metabolic stress is associated with temporary elevations in anabolic hormones like growth hormone, IGF-1 and testosterone, and this might promote hypertrophy. The third is that high metabolic stress could increase myokines that promote hypertrophy like interleukin-6 and decrease myokines that limit muscle growth like myostatin. The fourth is that reactive oxygen species, a metabolite, could play a role in promoting muscle growth. The fifth and final one is that metabolic stress is closely associated with a pump, as we already know. The pump is swelling of muscle fibers, and this swelling might actually activate certain osmoreceptors that go on to promote growth. Yet, all of these five paths have notable problems. With the first one, about metabolic stress resulting in more muscle fibers getting exposed to tension, it still indicates it's tension per se, not metabolic stress directly, that stimulates hypertrophy. With the second one, we nowadays have several studies consistently finding temporary elevations in anabolic hormones from training are not associated with long-term muscle hypertrophy. The increase in these anabolic hormones may be simply a result of energy usage and be unrelated to signaling hypertrophy. 
With myokines, the evidence is simply inconsistent on whether metabolic stress truly increases growth-promoting myokines, like interleukin-6, and decreases myokines that limit muscle growth, like myostatin. With the fourth and fifth ones, there exists alternative evidence suggesting reactive oxygen species and fiber swelling may not promote hypertrophy. Further areas of scientific research question the power of metabolic stress to produce hypertrophy. 400 meter running and sprint cycling can produce comparable lactate, a metabolite, increases to weight training. Yet these things do not promote hypertrophy anywhere near as effectively as weight training long term. A 2021 Brazil study had subjects train leg extensions with these variables. One condition rested passively between sets, while another condition restricted their leg with a cuff during the rest intervals, which led to greater overall lactate elevations versus the first condition. If lactate has additive effects on hypertrophy, this second condition should see more hypertrophy. Yet quadriceps growth ended up being similar between both conditions after eight weeks of training. Two other papers had two conditions. One condition involved subjects training normally with sets of reps to failure. The second condition also involved subjects training with sets of reps to failure. But once completing this, they had the trained limb blood flow restricted with a cuff for three to five minutes. This blood flow restriction trapped the metabolites in the muscle. And if metabolites were additive for hypertrophy, this condition should see more hypertrophy. Yet, after eight weeks, both studies found muscle growth was not enhanced when applying the blood flow restriction after training. One of the papers actually found it reduced muscle growth in the women subjects. So crystallizing this section, there's no strong evidence metabolic stress is a potent driver of muscle growth, and it doesn't appear to have additive effects on hypertrophy. I've also previously had a shorter video on muscle damage and hypertrophy. Although we'll mention things noted in that video, we will again go into greater depth here with extra topics. Substantial muscle damage occurs in the following days after performing intense exercise you're unaccustomed to. Delayed onset muscle soreness is considered to be a symptom of muscle damage in the scientific literature, and it's common for individuals to believe soreness is a strong indicator you've stimulated a muscle well. Interestingly, it isn't entirely clear if muscle damage is truly what independently causes delayed onset muscle soreness. There are many candidates on what causes soreness, and a lot more research is required before we can be certain of the relationship between damage and soreness. Besides soreness, it's frequently believed muscle growth directly occurs because exercising creates micro tears in the muscle. Your body responds by healing the micro tears and making the muscle bigger. These two videos with a combined near 40 million views both put forth this idea. But what does the literature say on the role of damage in muscle hypertrophy? It appears the hypothesis that damage could stimulate hypertrophy comes from research in the 1990s. It was noted that eccentric-only training produces significant muscle damage, but also notable muscle hypertrophy, so it was speculated damage could cause hypertrophy. It was also widely believed during these years, and in the subsequent years, that eccentric-only training is superior to concentric-only training for overall muscle hypertrophy. Concentric-only training produces much less damage. Nowadays, the evidence is very much mixed. There are actually more studies than not finding similar overall hypertrophy between eccentric and concentric-only training. Furthermore, it's essential to recognize eccentric training absolutely involves high mechanical tension. As eccentric-only training involves contraction and stretch at the same time, both active and passive tension will occur to high amounts. Some research directly links the overall tension produced during eccentric contractions to muscle hypertrophy signaling. Thus, it's entirely plausible eccentric only training is stimulating hypertrophy via tension itself, and damage is just a byproduct. But does this really mean muscle damage plays no role in hypertrophy? In 2012, Brad Schoenfeld from New York, the same researcher who performed a comprehensive review on metabolic stress a year later, published a comprehensive review on muscle damage and hypertrophy. Four paths were noted between damage and gains. The first is that damage results in an inflammation response, and various inflammatory cells have been linked to muscle hypertrophy. The second relates to satellite cells. This one requires a little bit of explaining, but it's highly interesting. Muscle fibers have nuclei, called myonuclei, and the myonuclei are crucial for directing the formation of the proteins that ultimately make muscle fibers bigger. Each myonuclei is believed to oversee a certain amount of space within muscle fibers, termed the myonuclei domain but there is a limit to the amount it can oversee, called the myonuclei domain ceiling. As a muscle fiber increases in size, 
the myonuclei domain increases until it hits its ceiling, limiting further muscle fiber growth. From here, additional myonuclei would be needed to enable further fiber growth. This is where satellite cells come in. They are found surrounding muscle fibers and can fuse to muscle fibers and donate nuclei, resulting in an increase in myonuclei which increases the muscle fiber growth capacity. This is where damage comes into play. Muscle damage appears to cause a significant increase in satellite cell activation, so perhaps damage can ultimately increase the number of myonuclei muscle fibers have, thereby meaning greater muscle fiber growth potential. The third path is that damage may potentiate IGF-1 production, and IGF-1 is involved in signaling hypertrophy. The fourth and final one is that damage causes muscle fiber swelling. Note, this swelling isn't the pump that occurs during training, rather it's swelling in the fiber days after training due to damage. But the mechanisms by which this swelling could create hypertrophy are hypothesized to be the same. That is, the swelling activates osmoreceptors that go on to promote hypertrophy. Yet, all four of these paths have notable problems. There is conflicting evidence on the role of inflammatory cells in hypertrophy. The events by which inflammatory cells are thought to contribute to hypertrophy may indeed occur in the absence of damage. With satellite cells, training that does not produce muscle damage can still cause significant satellite cell activation. In fact, aerobic training can activate satellite cells. In data indicating muscle damage may potentiate satellite cell activation, this may potentially be related to repairing the muscle fiber and connective tissue damage, not increasing the number of myonuclei in fibers. As for IGF-1 production, not all studies have actually found damage is associated with greater IGF-1 production, and as discussed in the metabolic stress section, several studies indicate temporary increases in anabolic hormones with training do not correlate with long-term hypertrophy. Finally, with muscle fiber swelling, also as discussed in the metabolic stress section, Alternative data exists implying swelling may not be causative of hypertrophy. Other lines of scientific research further question the importance of muscle damage for stimulating hypertrophy. A 2011 USA study assigned 14 untrained men into a pre-trained or naive group. The naive group performed eccentric exercise on a leg cycle ergometer for 20 straight minutes at a somewhat hard exertion level, measured using a subjective scale, three times per week for eight weeks. The pre-trained group did the same thing but they had a three-week ramp-up phase before their eight weeks, where they gradually acclimatized themselves to the training program. Due to this acclimatization phase, they ended up experiencing little amounts of damage and soreness across the training weeks, whereas the naive group experienced much higher damage and soreness levels across the training weeks. Yet, hypertrophy of the quadriceps ended up being comparable between both groups. Another 2016 study from Brazil found after untrained individuals performed a single training session, myofibular protein synthesis expectedly increased. Fascinatingly, however, this increase in myofibular protein synthesis did not correlate with muscle hypertrophy. Rather, it seems it was directed towards repairing the damage induced by that single training session. As the same subjects continued training for some weeks, which resulted in them experiencing less and less damage, as your body produces adaptations that make you resilient to muscle damage, it was only then the myofibular protein synthesis increase after training sessions correlated with muscle hypertrophy. Rephrasing all this, this data suggests after an initial workout that produces high muscle damage, the myofibular protein synthesis increase afterward is largely directed towards repairing the damage, not increasing muscle size. But after a few weeks of consistent training which allows the body to produce adaptations that reduce the damage experienced, then the myofibular protein synthesis response is strongly directed towards increasing muscle size. Various lines of evidence suggest excessive muscle damage may also be counterproductive for hypertrophy. For example, a 1999 USA study had men train eccentric bicep curls with these variables and found signs of damage and swelling persisted for seven days after the session. But once it subsided, muscle volume actually decreased to 10% of what it was before training, and it remained at this smaller size for numerous further weeks. This might be because excessive muscle damage causes partial or total destruction of subpopulations of muscle fibers. Marathon running has also been documented to cause significant muscle damage, yet some data finds marathon running decreases muscle fiber sizes. Furthermore, if muscle damage had additive effects on hypertrophy, we would expect using training variables that enhance damage to produce more growth, but this isn't the case. 
Higher repetitions likely cause more muscle damage, but we know they are similarly effective to lower reps for hypertrophy. Short rest between sets likely cause more muscle damage, but short rest between sets of exercises recruiting large amounts of muscle mass is actually suboptimal for hypertrophy. Finally, some individuals have speculated damage and soreness may be involved in hypertrophy based on research on antioxidant supplementation. That includes things like vitamin C and E. Some studies, but not all, find that antioxidant supplementation reduces damage and soreness after training. And there are some studies, but not all again, finding antioxidant supplementation reduces muscle growth in the long term. Thus, some presume this is fair evidence showing damage and soreness plays a role in hypertrophy. Yet, this data simply isn't sufficient to prove it is directly lower damage and soreness causing the lower hypertrophy. Some other factor could be involved. In fact, it's very possible antioxidant supplementation reduces the increase in capillaries that comes with lifting weights. And this matters as these capillary increases with training seem to be important for sustaining muscle growth long term. Therefore, the potential reduced muscle growth with antioxidant supplementation might not be due to a reduction in damage or soreness, but instead may be a reduction in capillary adaptations that usually come along with training. But also remember that I noted not all studies have actually found antioxidant supplementation reduces damage, soreness or long-term muscle growth. So crystallizing this section, there's no strong evidence muscle damage is a potent driver of muscle growth and it doesn't appear to have additive effects on hypertrophy. On the basis of everything outlined so far, it appears mechanical tension is probably the primary hypertrophy stimulus. There simply isn't compelling evidence that metabolic stress and muscle damage are powerful drivers of hypertrophy. Let us now dive deeper into what mechanical tension precisely is, as this can likely help us understand why certain training produces the results it does. I've come up with five depth levels to explain mechanical tension, from the simplest to the most in-depth descriptions. At the first level, the most simplest description is that muscle tension stimulates hypertrophy. Going deeper into the second level, we know muscles contain muscle fibers. It's the tension generated by muscle fibers that can be detected by mechanosensors, which are present in and around muscle fibers. Once these mechanosensors detect this tension, they convert it into a signaling cascade that results in the formation of the proteins that make muscle fibers larger. Going deeper into the third level, how precisely do muscle fibers generate force and what are the mechanosensors that detect this force? Fibers can produce force actively or passively through their force generating units called sarcomeres. Active forces occur when the myosin heads extend out from the myosin filament and attach and pull on actin filaments towards the M line. Passive forces occur when titan, which is actually the largest protein discovered in the human body, stretches. Though it's worth noting the extracellular matrix, which surrounds the muscle fiber, can also produce passive forces when stretched. Mechanosensing candidates that can detect these forces include costomere-related complexes that actually link the sarcomere to the extracellular matrix, filament which is a protein located at the Z-discs of sarcomeres, titan itself as it potentially has parts that can sense tension, the myonuclei of the fibers, and stretch-activated ion channels. Interestingly, the mechanosensors that detect either active or passive forces could be different. The costomere-related complexes and filament might only detect active forces, while titan, the myonuclear of muscle fibers and stretch activated ion channels may only detect passive forces. Now, these are just some of the candidates, and more research is needed overall before we can make more definitive conclusions on mechanosensors. In any case, once these mechanosensors detect tension, they go on to activate one of the many possible signaling pathways involved in forming the proteins that make muscle fibers grow. Going deeper to the fourth level, it's clear to see during an exercise we'd want to recruit as many muscle fibers as possible and have those individual fibers produce high respective forces. Yet, and this is the key point to the fourth level, we also want that tension to be produced for a decent duration. Merely having high levels of muscle fiber recruitment and force output from the fibers for a very brief duration isn't great for stimulating hypertrophy. This is demonstrated by the fact that one rep max training, that's lifting the heaviest load you can for a single rep, simply doesn't produce much, if any, hypertrophy. Despite it involving high muscle fiber recruitment and fiber forces, this is likely because the duration of tension is too short to meaningfully trigger the mechanosensors. 
Going to the deepest fifth level, we so far know during an exercise, we want to recruit as many fibers as possible and have those fibers produce high forces for a sufficient duration. Yet, and this is the key point to the fifth level, this all needs to be done within a given time window. Let me explain this with an example. Compare performing one set of a 30 second maximal isometric bench press contraction to performing 30 one second maximal isometric bench press contractions evenly spread throughout the full day. Both are maximal isometric bench press contractions, so involve high fiber recruitment and forces from the fibers. And both involve a total of 30 seconds of very high tension at the end of the day. But which do you think is more effective for stimulating hypertrophy? Probably the first one, the one set of a 30 second maximal isometric bench press contraction, as it involves all the tension within a given time window, which is probably more favorable for triggering the mechanosensors. Having the duration of high recruitment and fiber forces spread throughout the day and not in a given time window is presumably not as effective for triggering the mechanosensors optimally. So we arrive at our final overview of mechanical tension. During an exercise, we'd want to recruit as many muscle fibers as possible and have the individual fibers produce high respective forces for a decent duration. And this needs to be done within a given time window. The forces from the fiber can be active and or passive which get detected by mechanosensors that convert the tension and activate one of the many possible signaling pathways involved in forming the proteins that make muscle fibers grow. So during an exercise, how do we ensure high mechanical tension overall? Many assume training with heavier loads is the only way to achieve this. Indeed, this is why some speculated that blood flow restriction, which involves using light loads, isn't causing muscle growth through mechanical tension. But as we alluded to, this isn't a correct view of mechanical tension. Let's explore why. The characteristics of muscle fibers generally lie across a spectrum. On one end are fast twitch muscle fibers that are large, high force producing, but very fatigable. These fibers have the greatest growth potential, as alluded to when discussing blood flow restriction training a while back. On the other end are slow twitch fibers that are small, low force producing, but highly fatigue resistant. These fibers don't have the greatest growth potential. Muscle fibers are recruited sequentially. When the muscle needs to generate low forces, only slow twitch fibers need to be recruited. But as a muscle needs to generate progressively larger forces, or as it fatigues while trying to sustain a given force output, those faster twitch muscle fibers eventually get recruited. This sequential recruitment of muscle fibers is known as Henneman's size principle, as it's Eelwood Henneman who first discovered all this during his pioneering research in the 1960s. From this, it's clear heavier loads, as it instantly requires high muscle forces to move the load, produce high muscle fiber recruitment, and it would only increase as you near failure. Also, many of the individual fibers sustain relatively high forces throughout all of this. Lighter loads, including blood flow restriction training, as it initially only needs low muscle forces to move the load, would only require slow twitch fiber recruitment. But the key point is that as you continue performing reps and near failure with this light load, you eventually recruit those faster twitch muscle fibers. Many of the individual fibers sustain relatively high forces throughout all this too. Therefore, the last few reps just before failure are where the duration of exposure to overall high mechanical tension would be similar between light and heavier loading. This is more than likely why both light and heavy loads have been shown to be able to produce similar muscle hypertrophy when reps are performed near or to failure. This is also more than likely why training near or to failure with whatever load you're using is more favorable for hypertrophy than training further from failure. Now, I should note very light loads, even if you get near or to failure, probably won't be optimal for stimulating hypertrophy. This is because too high rep numbers likely generate excessive within session central fatigue that inhibits your ability to effectively recruit and expose those faster twitch muscle fibers to tension. Very heavy loads aren't the most optimal for stimulating hypertrophy per set either, as the duration of overall high mechanical tension would be too brief. We alluded to this point earlier when noting how one rep max training doesn't build much muscle at all. Mechanical tension being the primary hypertrophy stimulus might have another training implication. There's an ever-increasing number of studies finding that training muscles at stretched positions is powerful for building muscle. We have a whole video detailing the research behind this. Exercises that train muscles in a stretched position likely involve significant contribution from both active and passive forces, and this might potentially explain the greater hypertrophy. Myosin and actin interact to generate active forces, while titan and the surrounding extracellular matrix too. 
Generate passive forces Remember, different mechanosensors might detect either active or passive forces, so ensuring both of these are high in an exercise may have additive effects on signaling muscle growth. Passive forces from Titan while the muscle is producing active forces might also be greater versus passive forces from Titan while the muscle is not producing active forces. Emerging evidence alludes to this. You see, calcium influx into the muscle fiber is what fundamentally permits myosin and actin to interact to generate active forces, but these calcium ions with active tension might also interact with Titan to make it stiffer too, allowing it to generate greater passive forces. These greater passive forces are probably more effective at triggering the mechanosensors. This could explain why passive forces with no active tension, as done when static stretching, isn't very effective for stimulating hypertrophy in humans, but passive forces combined with active forces, as done in exercises training muscles at stretched positions, are highly effective. Though extreme static stretching itself can probably build muscle. For example, this recent German study found that performing this calf stretch for one hour every day in humans did produce significant gastrocnemius growth. I should mention, although I believe the evidence suggests these things about active and passive tension being additive could very much be the case, otherwise I would not have detailed it, it's 100% not a confirmed definitive fact. Further research is required to validate it, but for the time being, I'm comfortable speculating that what I've described may be what's going on. Before closing out this video, I think it's worth presenting some speculative hypertrophy models. It's evident mechanical tension is the primary hypertrophy stimulus, and I don't think it's completely crazy to speculate mechanical tension could literally be the sole stimulus behind hypertrophy. Other things like metabolic stress and muscle damage may simply be a byproduct of training. Opposed to this, although we noted there aren't any strong categorized paths by which metabolic stress or damage promotes hypertrophy, nor is there strong evidence that more of them is better or additive. This cannot definitively prove they play a 0% role in hypertrophy. Perhaps both metabolic stress and muscle damage at very low levels are involved in hypertrophy, with no further benefit beyond these very low levels. Thus, virtually all types of training pass this threshold, explaining why more of these things aren't associated with greater hypertrophy. Furthermore, we cannot rule out that future research will find some categorized path by which low levels of metabolic stress and damage relate to hypertrophy. Finally, it is also possible there exist other stimuli that play a small role in hypertrophy that have yet to be thoroughly examined in the literature. For example, some studies find training in hypoxic environments, that's environments with lower levels of oxygen, produces more hypertrophy than training in normoxic environments, that's environments with normal oxygen levels. Now, hypoxia and metabolic stress can be related. But hypoxia itself could be a direct stimulus for gains dissociated from metabolite buildup. Yet, it's essential to note a number of opposing studies find no difference in muscle growth between training in hypoxic and normoxic environments, making the overall link between hypoxia and hypertrophy unclear. Mechanical tension seems to be the primary hypertrophy stimulus. There simply isn't compelling evidence metabolic stress or damage are powerful drivers of hypertrophy. It's possible small amounts of metabolic stress and damage play a role in hypertrophy, and it's also possible other stimuli yet to be properly assessed in the research could play a role in hypertrophy. Future research is needed to validate whether this is true or not. Recall our final overview of mechanical tension was as follows. During an exercise, We'd want to recruit as many muscle fibers as possible and have the individual fibers produce high respective forces for a decent duration, and this needs to be done within a given time window. The forces from the fiber can be active and or passive, which get detected by mechanosensors that convert the tension and activate one of the many possible signaling pathways involved in forming the proteins that make muscle fibers grow. Ultimately, getting to or close to failure with a wide range of loads achieves high mechanical tension. Moreover, it's possible that exercises that train muscles at a fairly stretched length are superior for hypertrophy, since it involves both high active and passive tension. As always, the references to the studies mentioned in this video can be found in the description. Whether you're curious about reading further into anything mentioned in this video, or you're skeptical of anything I've said, I highly encourage you to check out any of the references. I'm always up for a discussion if you disagree or want anything clarified further in the comment section. All the best. If you've made it here, I have a free ebook you might like. 
the ultimate guide to bench pressing for strength and hypertrophy with more than 100 scientific references. From technique to training variables to comparisons and other fascinating science, we cover it all. Grab it through the link in the description or comments. Thank you.